So this is about a year or two into the 6th generation of consoles, and the quality of the games coming out is at a very, very high bar. Aiko, of course, being a part of that. I've only played through this game until quite recently, to be honest. I still want to sort of get into it, see what the big appeal is and why it has resonated with so many people. Okay, so to give a brief rundown, you are Aiko, a young boy set off to get imprisoned because you have horns on your head and they're bad luck. He then manages to break out, meets up with Yorda, breaks her out, and then set off to escape. The gameplay loop mainly consists of traversal, puzzling, and fighting, all of which involve Yorda's AI to a certain degree. You have to help her make jumps over gaps, lead her in the right direction, and make sure that she's as close to you as possible. A shadow getting a hold of Yorda turns the game into a pretty nerve-wracking time trial where you have to save her in time. You're always made to think about where you choose to go, especially without Yorda. So if there are two or more loading screens and or a long climbing course that separate the two of you, then there's your warning. <coughs> and none of these mechanics are explained outright to the player with hints or prompts that take up a large portion of the screen. The game just speaks for itself. Visual feedback when Aiko runs, jumps, hits, and grabs are so akin to that of an actual little boy. Carrying large objects makes him shift backwards and walk like a crab. Fighting shadows makes him desperately flail his weapon around back and forth, and getting back up from a hit kind of takes forever. Even though the controls can be pretty imprecise, it works great from a thematic perspective. It's pretty easy to see why, at the time, this game had a hard time competing with its peers from a marketing standpoint. It wasn't a cheesy, rock fuel with adrenaline rush with huge replayability or an expansive open world for you to lead up to ranks in, or a sequel to one of the most beloved PS1 games of all time. It was a simple adventure game with minimal dialogue and audio, but its significance is felt all the more today. So with development having started in 2002, the director, Fumito Ueda, was looking to pursue a more action-oriented kind of game with recognizable systems, something that Aiko was actively working against. Health bars, stamina meters, hints, and the like. But its unconventional structure is one of the main things that really sets it apart. That being, fighting one boss after another. You, Wander, bring a young woman to a temple with the hopes to bring her back to life. A voice tells you that they'll do it if you kill the Colossi the land, and that's that. Aside for the simple premise, there's actually a lot to compare to Ico here. The, the control schemes are practically the same. You grab onto things and call out your AI partner with R1, attack with square, jump with triangle, and yeah. The field music is mostly relegated to environmental folly, the dialogue is minimal, cutscenes are kept really short, etc, etc. But of course, these pointers don't make the game any less unique, and more serve as a part of Team Ico's style. The gameplay is very different, in fact. And while Ico is about puzzle solving and keeping the partner safe, Shadow of the Colossus is basically about killing everything that's in your way. It incorporates many st staples of action games, such as stamina management, dodging and precision, but the big thing the game rewards is patience. To reach the climatic high of getting in that thrust on a colossi,
You must first assess the composition of your post character design. Where is the fur to climb onto? Is there an area for me to shoot an arrow to? They're like puzzles of themselves. And as the amount of stabs required to take down a colossi don't really reach over a single digit, so much emphasis and detail is placed on the journey your tiny player character has climbing the beast. Tumbles around from hits that graze him, heavy and brisk movements from the bosses make his body flail around, and puts a pause on any climbing you were doing. The animation in overall, just like Ico, is a truly impressive achievement. Although again, while very consistent with what's shown on screen, can make playability occasionally finicky and frustrating. The atmosphere of the whole thing is still really engrossing to this day. The colors and textures, while not explosive, are incredibly detailed and vibrant. The use of fog and light beautifully reinforces the idea that the land you're adventuring is one of legends forgotten to history, and it uses clever in-game ways to showcase your progress. The scale of each fight never ceases to be, well, epic. As you climb onto the enemy, the melody changes seamlessly from subdued and uncertain to triumphant and aggrandizing as you rise to the upper ground and take center stage, and then it goes back to cold and somber, just for you to do it all over again. But there is more than meets the eye, of course, that of which I do not wish to spoil. If you have a PS2, PS3, PS4, whatever, definitely check it out. Because of unfortunate development hell, relating to Ueda's departure from Sony in 2011, technical issues, among other problems, had this game skip an entire generation only to release in 2016, the kind of development that was oddly in vogue that year? Regardless, that could be its own discussion entirely. You play a little boy who wakes up in a room next to a big winged animal-like creature, and from there, you go on an adventure to escape. If it sounds familiar, well, it very much is. Weak little child, AI partner that doesn't speak much, traversal puzzles, etc. In a lot of ways, this game kind of feels like Team Ico's second attempt at Ico, only in reverse. Instead of protecting your AI partner from enemies, it is now your duty to direct it to protect you. Instead of holding out your hand to help your, your partner jump across a gap, you have to point for it to jump to that spot, but with the power balance shifted comes a new challenge, actually getting it to obey. In the early stages of the two characters getting accustomed to one another, moving around with Trico can be pretty confusing. I'll just, you can just see here, it's a bit of a, bit of a hassle. Once again, this admittedly somewhat janky approach makes thematic sense, and while it can sometimes hinder the game's pacing and be frustrating, it's equally as satisfying to see Trico progress in the right direction. It makes for moments of joy where your partner makes a seemingly impossible jump to an adjoining building, actually playable character building sequences where the game's unwritten rules are wonderfully manipulated aside for the frame rate. This game is a technical knockout. We're talking lighting, shading, animation, blending, score implementation. I could go on. These programmers really went above and beyond to present this artistic vision for the hardware they did. Which does come at a cost occasionally, when it comes to performance, of course. Team Ico, now gen design, sort of, is just in their element here and it's a joy to see their style again, now rendered at such a high fidelity that once again sets a new bar. A lot of elements from their two previous outings can be found here, but The Last Guardian still stands as its own unique entity and does great justice to the studio's legacy. We're looking forward to the next outing, hopefully it doesn't take too long. <laughs>